Our next speaker is Henrik Klo. Um, he's project manager at IVL, the uh, Swedish Environmental Research Institute. And his talk will be about the holistic water management and a uh, new concept that, that were developed. Um, Henrik, I'm, I'm happy that you're here and give you the floor to start your talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I put on my webcam so you can see me, but I will switch it off now to make sure that to minimize all risks. So now you will only hear me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, uh, this part of this biowater was sort of was intended to make uh, a little bit overview. You can say we heard a lot of details about membranes and, and, and specific flows yesterday, but this is more sort of a framework for what we can call it a, a water management and, and what really water management is, is something that is not very easy to define, but, but maybe it's a bit clear after this presentation or it's confusing, but on another level. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> we can see it water management from different perspectives. I mean, we can have this product perspective, like you have life cycle on a specific product. Uh, we talk, talked a lot about a coffee now, 440 liters for a cup of coffee. There's a uh, lot of water usage in, in different stages of the of the product life cycle. Um, but we we look more into the industrial part uh, of this. And uh, the inspiration might come from the com from a corporate perspective. Somebody at the headquarters is sort of lifting the question on water uh, and start writing policies and so on. I think this is a very important step for everybody who's supposed to work with water in the in the corporation to have this management support. But on this level, you can also uh, decide on investments, for example, uh, to make sure, and also on purchasing decisions to make sure that you don't come into problems when it comes to supply chain, for example. I mean, if you have difficulties to get, to, to get supply because the supply sites are, has water problems. Uh, and then we have the site perspective, which is sort of a bit bottom-up perspective, you can see. Uh, and every site is placed on different places, and they have their, their, specific, <clears throat> their specific problems or specific opportunities with water supply and legal aspects and, and stuff like that. Um, but first, when when to start with water? I mean, I just imagine that we have a corporation now, the water has not been on the table really before, and, and now they see realize that we have to work on this. Where, where should we start? What should we think about? What should be the important things? And the first thing I would say is to look into the external driving forces. Do we have legal, legal requirements or the effects on recipients? Do we have a water stress or flooding or risk is in the, making a risk assessment? Or we just want to sort of be being a nice neighbor, so to, say, to have a good reputation? Uh, this can be, and the, the, this driving forces is, can be very different depending on where, where the site is, of course, that's where said. But there can also be a lot of internal driving forces, I mean, to secure supply, of course. Um, but also process stability, uh, the quality of the incoming water and quality of the outgoing water. There might be seasonal variations, <clears throat> uh, not, not very, use, very useful that there are. Uh, sometimes you can have, when you're making new investments, that is an excellent window of opportunity for, for uh, making, the right, making things right from the beginning. Uh, we had a discussion a moment ago about old facilities. And of course, there's a lot of low-hanging fruits there with old, with old facilities, but sometimes they need to refresh the facilities, and in the, these are very good opportunities to, to make. Um, and, uh, and, and in general, we, water is not only water, it's also related to costs, quality, uh, quality and, and we are talking about processes that are using water for some reason. We we'll come back to that. So. So water, uh, working with water can also be a way, way to work with waste reduction or, or energy efficiency. So the, that's the sort of the holistic part of this water management that take these kind of things into account as well. Uh, <clears throat> one thing to realize is that we are using water for many different purposes. Um, 
And that means that also the, the quality requirement of the water is, can be very different. Use it as an energy carrier that is like cooling water, for example, co cooling uh, system. Then, then water just, just sort of taking care of the energy and it, uh, it's not the H2O part that is important. It can be a transport medium and it's the same thing. It's very low <laughs> quality of use. You can say like flush, flushing a toilet, for example, and water is just a transport medium. But it can also be used as a solvent or a cleaner or a chemical, and then you normally have much higher requirements on, on the quality. You can look at this cab, for example, from my previous uh, employer, AB Volvo, which is work, working with water management there as well. Uh, in that case, they have water-borne solvents uh, in, in the paint shop. But uh, below this cab, there is a scrubber, a water scrubber that takes care of the overspray. And that's another way to use the water now as more or less a transport medium. And the requirements of the water in the scrubber is, of course, much different from the requirements of the water in the solvents in the paint. Uh, so it can be part of the product, like the solvents, then, and, and it can be... Then we have also the, the storm water, which is not really used of water, it's just water that happens, and, and that has to be taken care of. But the point with this slide is that uh, there, this creates opportunities for recycling. I mean, <clears throat> you can, for example, have a process where high quality demands and use the water and then you can have a more low-tech uh, cleaning device for example and that creates a uh, creates a water that is quite okay to use transport medium or as, as just a rubber or whatever so uh, this you can, can compare it a little bit with a pinch analysis that you can do uh, when you're working with energy um, and by the way, many, many uh, organizations that have been working with energy savings can actually apply very much the same thinking when working with water, but there are some, some difference. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this water man in this water management system, we uh, elaborated a little bit on the key elements of it. What should it contain? And uh, these are the, we have ended up in three boxes here. Uh, the first one is about external conditions, as I talked about earlier. Uh, that is something that you have to sort of take into account. Do you have a problem with water scarcity, or is the more a problem of, of the wastewater treatment, or etc. Uh, but then in the box to the yeah, uh, we have sort of the organizational part of, of the wastewater management system, governance and internal engagement, uh, have some kind of working group, have support from, from, uh, from management, etc. But also to create internal engagement. Maybe all employees can have their eyes open for dripping, <laughs> dripping taps or whatever, uh, or, or ideas for improvements. And it can be sort of, you can apply if you have a, a continuous improvement work with, with Kaizen works, things like that, that can be applied as well here. Uh, here we also set up vision targets and action plans and, and do measurement and follow up. Uh, the next key element is more of the practical side, that is to have control of the site's water situation, to know about the source supplies and withdrawal situation, to know what's going on within the factory, the usage, and also to know what are the, the requirements and what are the possibilities on the discharge or even the possibilities to use recycle the discharge water so these are sort of the <clears throat> some cornerstones in a water management system uh, then when it comes to implementation you can follow a step-by-step -step, uh, process here uh, starting with the understanding external conditions establishing the governance so that we have sort of a, the, the practice the, the um, organization on place then a big work to collect uh, data, assess baselines, where, where is water used, for what reason, et cetera, et cetera, how much is it? And in this stage, you often find a lot of sort of very low hanging fruits, like more or less silly things that is going on that no one was really aware of, um, but it can also so realize, so, so there's a lot of improvements that can be done just by looking at it from the beginning. But then maybe you'll end up in a number of 
specific actions uh, that you need to prioritize and conduct and make visibility start, uh, uh, analysis, setting targets, taking action and follow up. So now you are really in this traditional plan, do, check, act uh, circle that, that is so commonly used within all kind of improvement activities within in industry today. And it can also be connected to so if you have, have sort of active work on, for example, lean production with resource efficiency in, in, in mind, that can, this aspect can also be included in that. So basically the, the goal should be to go from this liner type of water usage, going in, use, going out, uh, to, uh, to a circular system. And also these circles within the factory can be specific processes that, that can have their own ecosystem, so to say. Well, anyway, uh, as I said, this we came up into this sort of plan, do, check, act cycle here, uh, but then we are rather mature in our implementation and, and we can prioritize new uh, actions and set new targets, etc. Um, when we are sort of clever in this uh, water management, we can also engage with our stakeholders around it to sort of give good ideas, help uh, maybe help, maybe help suppliers uh, with their water management and, or, or, or uh, neighbors and things like that. Yes. Um, one thing that is we also looked into in this uh, work package and, and in the water management is uh, these measurement things, the follow-up, we call it performance indexes or key performance indexes. And that is a very a chapter by itself. Uh, to measure is to know, usually say, but that then you really have to measure the right thing. There's a lot of KPIs going on in the industry, and, and some of these are, can be rather confusing. They can consist of different parameters in, in some kind of calculation that we, we doesn't really give very much understanding. So <clears throat> we propose here sort of a, a um, cool process for, uh, for designing KPIs, starting with the why. Why do we need? this kind of information and who do need this, this information and for what purpose. So then you can ask, ask yourself what kind of information is needed and how should we gather that information and, and how should we, it be presented. And then last you go to these things that some people start with, namely, namely the data gathering and the analysis method. And uh, keeping in mind also the KPI is a living thing. So you can have a KPI for just reporting. You can have it for in some kind of improvement projects to see was it, has it been better now than before. Or you can have it for, for, um, <clears throat> for control, process control, for example. So uh, being aware of, of what, what performance indexes is needed and for what purpose, that is one of the key things. And we have a special chapter about that in, in our report. Um, here follows <clears throat> three slides that is sort of how to break down um, the analysis. Uh, here, the first one, you see the, um, uh, here you see sort of the, the factory as a black box with co something coming in from different sources and going out from different sources. Uh, on the next level, you start to analyze, analyze what is going on inside the factory like specific processes here is one sort of process, there's another one, and, and uh, all these can sort of, there you go, you have, you make another more detailed mapping of each of these. You maybe have just cooling processes that is just leaving uncontaminated water to discharge. This will often end up in very high numbers. So if you are reporting your water uses from a site to your corporate uh, environmental group, uh, there, they would report a very high number, but it doesn't really say so much of what kind of water activity is going on within your site to them. So I think it's important to sort of separate the reporting from, from different kind of usage. Uh, and on the next level, then you can go into detail on, on a specific process, like we heard a lot about yesterday, for example, at uh, Sun Leak, uh, where, where they sort of looked into these phosphates uh, recovery and things like that. And here the KPIs can be so many and so detailed that you really need to have a digital follow-up uh, to, to optimize the process. Um, 
Yes, <clears throat> that was a short overview of this. So the key messages that we will send here is that starting from the local external condition, that is sort of the prime driving force for working with water, uh, and also sets very much of what kind, what uh, priorities it should do and, 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 and strategy and so on. Then assure the governance internally and, and engagement and set the missions. It can be, of course, very difficult to get engagement from everybody if you don't have any ambitions. So <laughs> then these things go really hand in hand. And then the big work is to assess the baseline, analyze the usage, prioritize and perform activities that is leading to an overall resource efficiency. Uh, that is that you can, may, maybe the reason for working with this is more to save, for example, the phosphates like in Sandviken, uh, and sometimes it's just to save water by itself. Uh, here we can analyze uh, analyze the water uses in an LCA perspective, and I think Freddie Dinkel will talk a lot about that uh, in a moment. Um, and then, last but not least, use efficient metrics for reporting improvement and control. Um, who who needs what information for what purpose, really? So that was my presentation. Thank you, Hen uh, thank you, Henrik. Um, we already got some questions for you in, in the chat. Um, so one question would be um, if we aren't we already in the circular water management, um, given that 90% of water use in, uh, is recirculated within the site dams uh, on site? Uh, Sophie asked this. Well, there might be sites that are that good, but not all, <laughs> can assure. Uh, yeah, be, be, as I said, there is a lot of diff different levels of maturity within different industries. So, uh, and, and I, I have seen so those that are very, very advanced, and those that are just sort of starting. So this is this is basically a help for for those who are starting. And I can also say that that uh, uh, <clears throat> many sites has uh, like ISO forty thousand and stuff like that. So this can sort of be incorporated into that framework. Um, that is practical, but giving a special focus on water. Then. Yeah, I think I also think that that maybe uh, a couple of things are already done mm. within uh, some sites and some companies. But uh, the idea was also that this can be further integrated and that it's easy to integrate some more uh, measures here, right? Yes, I mean you can sort of. If I go back to to this one, uh, you, you, if you. You, you can jump in anywhere here, depending on maybe you already have done this, if you are a little bit more advanced. Maybe you have realized that we have a specific process that we need to work work with without sort of doing the whole mapping of the whole site. So, uh, so uh, of course, you can jump into this circle um, <clears throat> as soon mm -hmm. as you realize that you have an opportunity. And another question would be, uh, how is the issue of treated effluent quality and uncertainty thereof dealt with in the integrated holistic approaches that were presented? What about negative cumulative effects on water bodies? Any comment on that, Henrik? <clears throat> well, that was a tricky question. I tried to <laughs> make a head and tail of it. Um, <clears throat> well, the treated... the. Treated effluent quality, of course, that has to, has a relationship to to the sensitivity of the res, of the recipient, um, uh, and sometimes uh, I was, for example, in my previous job at Volvo, we were I was engaged in a, in a, a setting up a plant in India, and there there were no recipient at all. <laughs> so so the thing we had to do there was to have a real zero discharge system. Uh, and we also looked into different uses. <clears throat> so, it's, for example, domestic wastewater can be used, can be sort of treated biologically, and, and since there are not any dangerous chemicals in it, they can use it for irrigation. But industrial wastewater had to go really into <clears throat> these circular systems with no discharge anywhere. Uh, and on other places, you may have a very not so sensitive recipient or a, or a very high dilution effect, for example. <clears throat> Uh, Hendrik, as we have to go on with our program, uh, can you maybe take the time and uh, answer some of the further questions we have in our open chat um, while the next one uh, of the speaker is coming up? Yes, I'm glad to do that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. 